Good evening, and welcome to Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm the Reverend Abhi Janamanchi. My pronouns are he, him, and I serve as Cedar Lane Senior Minister. Please know that whoever you are, wherever you're from, whomever you love, and whatever your gender identity, life circumstance, immigration status, or political affiliation, we welcome you. Please take a moment to share in the chat your name, affiliation, and where you're joining us from. I would like to extend a special welcome to our elected and public officials who are joining us tonight, and also members of the media who are with us. If this is your first time in a Unitan Universalist setting, we want you to know that we're part of a congregational Protestant lineage of Christian congregations, but that more than a century ago, we decided that we would rather build our religious community on the promises we make about how we respect and treat each other, rather than on uniformity and conformity of belief. Our shared covenant affirms and promotes the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Our religion, Unitarian Universalism, is this worldly and affirms life before death. It has always emphasized the creation of the beloved community on this earth rather than preparation for the next. To that end, we are contemporary in our emphasis and our moral and ethical framework is held up against the very real issues of our day. This emphasis on the present makes our faith relevant to the moment and to the issues which confront us as people who are attempting to live with integrity in the specific time and place into which history has thrust us. Our faith affirms that for a religion to work, we have to work at it. For a religion to work, we have to have not only liturgy and ritual, not only contemplative or reflective practices, but also practices of integrity, which is a way to bring what we believe, what we value, and what we cherish closer and closer to what we do in the world every day. And we are called to resist again and again the powers and principalities that seek to oppress, demean, and dehumanize. But our faith cannot end at the barricades or the protests in the streets. It also calls us to engage in the deeper and difficult work of dismantling structures and institutions that promote inequity and injustice and advocate for policies and actions that are just, fair, and equitable to keep making good trouble, necessary trouble, until the vision of the beloved community is a living, vibrant reality. As we gather tonight, we pause for a few moments to hold in our hearts and lift up the names of Trayford Pellerin, who was shot and killed by police in Lafayette, Louisiana, and Jacob Blake, who was shot and grievously wounded by the police in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Justice for Jacob Blake and Trayford Pellerin means ending state-sanctioned violence against the black community. So friends, let us hold the silence together in mourning and lament, in anguish and sorrow, and in remembrance and memory for Jacob and Trayford and all the lives lost. In this space of silence, may the holy move through to make justice. May it be so. 
I now turn it over to the chair of the Kiplinger Lecture Team, Mr. William Zelmer, to share more about the Kiplinger Lecture and introduce our 2020 Kiplinger Lecture. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Reverend Abi. Welcome, everyone. Let me first recognize the members of Cedar Lane who serve on the Kiplinger Lecture team. You see their names on the screen. It has been our privilege to organize this year's lecture. The Kiplinger Lecture on Ethics in American Society, now in its 20th year, was made possible by a generous grant from the Kiplinger Foundation in memory of Willard M. Kiplinger, an early member of Cedar Lane, and the founder of the Kiplinger Washington Letter. This annual lecture aims to promote a wider consciousness and a deeper understanding of concepts and questions of ethics and morality, and to move individuals to apply the, that understanding in their lives. In announcing the foundation's grant to Cedar Lane, Willard Kiplinger's son, Austin, had this to say. As a lifelong journalist, my father was keenly aware of the impact of ethics on daily work and life. And he would be gratified by this program to examine the application of ethics in today's global society. Members of the Kiplinger family are tuned into today's lecture. And I want to say to them how grateful the Cedar Lane community is for the gift that made this program possible. Thank you. Before I introduce the speaker, let me call your attention to the Q&A feature of this webcast, which you can use to enter questions and comments for discussion after the speaker's formal remarks. Moderating that part of the program will be Corey Turner, an education correspondent for NPR and a member of our planning team. We are very pleased to have as our Kiplinger lecturer for 2020, John B. King Jr., who will speak on the moral imperative for educational equity. Dr. King's strong career-long advocacy for addressing inequities in public education is timely and perfectly on point with the purpose of this lecture series. Dr. King is the president and CEO of the Education Trust, a national nonprofit civil rights organization that seeks to identify and close opportunity and achievement gaps from preschool through college for students of color and those from low income backgrounds. Dr. King served in President Barack Obama's cabinet as the 10th Secretary of Education. In tapping him for this role, President Obama called Dr. King an exceptionally talented educator, citing his commitment to preparing every child for success and his lifelong dedication to education as a teacher, principal, and leader of schools and school systems. Dr. King's life story is an extraordinary testament to the transformative power of education. Both of his parents were career New York City public school educators. Dr. King's parents passed away from illness by the time he was 12 years old. He credits New York City public school teachers for saving his life by providing him with rich and engaging educational experiences and by giving him hope for the future. Dr. King's preparation for a leadership role in American society included earned degrees from Harvard University, Yale Law School, and Columbia University. He lives in Silver Spring, Maryland, with his wife, who is a former kindergarten and first grade teacher, and his two daughters, who attend local public schools. Dr. King, thank you for agreeing to present the 2020 Kiplinger Lecture. We're eager to hear your message, and I now turn over the program to you.
Thanks so much, Bill. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining the event this evening. It's an honor to be with you, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, the discussion tonight. What Eleanor Roosevelt said so convincingly 60 years ago is true again today. This is no ordinary time. And we may not be at the brink of world war as the country was when she spoke those words in the summer of 1940, but the challenges we face as a nation are great. Nearly 180,000 people have died from the novel coronavirus, a disease for which there is, as of this moment, no cure and no vaccine. Millions are out of work as students and families face impossible choices about going back to school all because the federal government and far too many state leaders downplayed the seriousness of this pandemic and never got it under control. They issued mixed messages about basic public health measures and opened bars and restaurants while the virus continued to spread. School closures were inevitable, an inevitable outcome of dangerous public mismanagement of the virus. And school closures have an incredible impact on our children who rely on their schools as a safe haven, as a place where they can develop strong, healthy relationships with peers and adults, as a place where they're supported to learn and grow. I understand the stakes personally. As Bill said, both my parents passed away when I was a kid. Uh, my mom passed when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. And in between, I, I lived with my dad who was quite sick with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. So home was this place that was scary and unpredictable and chaotic and unstable. But school, school was the place where I had consistency, where I had relationships with teachers who made school safe and nurturing, where I was challenged and engaged. And if I hadn't had those experiences in school, I don't think I'd be alive today. Maybe I'd be in prison. School saved my life. And I fear for the kids who have been without school all through the spring, and now many going into this new school year. Alongside all these challenges associated with COVID-19, right now we're also grappling with the killings of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and too many other African Americans. These murders serve as tragic reminders that while we may say Black Lives Matter, Black life too often is treated with disdain and disregard. Just this weekend, as Reverend Abi mentioned, Wisconsin police officer shot a black man, Jacob Blake, multiple times in the back as his three children, his three babies, ages three, five, and eight, looked on. Indeed, there's no vaccine for COVID-19, nor for systemic racism, as Senator Harris pointed out last week. These dual pandemics threaten our lives and our livelihoods. At the same time, we have hurricanes tearing across the South, fires raging in the West, a collective failure to protect the planet in the reckless pursuit of profit has made us more vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And despite broad public support for gun safety measures, we still don't have the common sense policies around guns that we need and cannot spare lives or spare our children the fear of school shootings as a result. I know this feels like a lot, and it is. The question, the question for any of the challenges we face, including a lack of education equity, which is the primary focus of my work, is what should we do about it? That to me is the essential question of ethics. What should we do about the challenges and injustices we see in this world? And is there a moral imperative for us to help, as Kant might have asked? My answer, as we'll discuss today, is a resounding yes. We have a moral imperative to act. I've always appreciated that the Unitarian Universalist tradition holds up ethics not merely as a contemplative endeavor, but really as a call to action. You know, Unitarian Universalists count in your community, consequential American presidents like John Adams and courageous abolitionists like Lucy Stone. As a former high school history teacher, I often look to our past 
to put the present in context, to be inspired by the lives and legacies of those who come before us, to help us understand how to shape a better future. I'd like to talk today about one of those people, one of those historical figures, someone who chose to act, someone who's probably familiar to many of you, to frame our conversation about ethics and education equity. Now at the Education Trust, the organization I lead, we started teleworking, like many folks, on March 16th, the Monday after the COVID-19 National Emergency Declaration. And every week since that time, I've selected a different civil rights leader as my video background for my many, many, many Zoom conversations. And this background uh, is going to be a theme in our conversation today. Over the course of these weeks, I've featured folks like Frederick Douglass and Shirley Chisholm, John Lewis, Dolores Huerta, and many others. Behind me today is James Reeb. Many of you may be familiar with James Reeb and his efforts as part of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Reeb served as a Unitarian Universalist minister at All Souls Church in Washington, D.C and worked with the American Friends Service Committee in Boston. The day after Bloody Sunday in March 1965, Dr. King called on fellow clergy around the country to come to Selma to continue the protests for racial justice. Reeb at that time asked the Unitarian Universalist headquarters in Boston whether he was needed. Their response, badly. And so he went. He joined hundreds at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And after the march, Reeb visited Walter's Cafe, a black owned restaurant. And when he left, he was beaten by several white men. And days later, he died from those injuries. The three attackers were acquitted and Reeb's murder went unsolved until recently when a fourth man came clean about what happened and a woman admitted she lied in court. And that's the part of the James Reeb story you likely already know. A tale of moral action, a tale of a man choosing to act in solidarity across lines of racial difference. A tale that shows the sacrifice of those who came before us like Jim Reeb and the black military veteran activist and deacon Jimmy Lee Jackson who fought and died in support of the right of every person to have a say in who represents them and in the laws that govern our nation. Footage of Bloody Sunday on national television, reports of the killings of civil rights workers, and continued nonviolent pressure from John Lewis, Dr. King, and countless well-organized women and men forced President Johnson to send the Voting Rights Act to Congress and sign it into law. The willingness to act when called upon to dismantle injustice, that ethical choice, it indeed makes a difference that reverberates across history. Uh, but it's plain to see that the right to vote is under constant threat to this day. Like many of you, I worry deeply about this upcoming election in the midst of a pandemic, especially because of the recent fractures in the infrastructure of democracy. In 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court gutted the law that Reeb and Jackson and so many others died for. In her dissenting opinion, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg argued that removing the requirement for Southern states to clear election law changes with the Department of Justice was like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. Legislation in many states that followed the Supreme Court's decision suppress voting rights in so many communities and prove Justice Ginsburg's metaphor act. You might be wondering what all of this has to do with education and ethics. But before I draw that thread a little more about, I want to share a little more about James Reed's story, which you might not know about. But before I do that, let me make the point that Congress ought to take action and pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Amendment Act in order to honor John Lewis, in order to protect our democracy, in order to protect our elections, in order to ensure the right to vote for which Jim Reed gave his life. Now, what does the Jim Reed story have to do with our discussion of ethics and education? 
Let me tell you a little bit about what Reeb was doing in Boston when he got that call to come to Selma. He was fighting for equity to address unequal access both to safe and affordable housing and to high quality public education. He was fighting against segregation and discrimination. He was, as they say, walking the walk. Reeb, his wife, and their four children moved to Dorchester in Boston. At that time, Dorchester was a largely African-American neighborhood. In fact, Dorchester was where the first black landowner in Boston bought a plot of land back in 1656. And African-Americans still comprise the largest group of residents in that community today. The Reeb's chose to send their children to local public schools. The ma majority of the kids in those schools were black. James Reeb's office was in Roxbury, the same part of Boston where 30 years later, as a young African-American and Latino college student, I became involved in public service, running summer programs and after school programs for young people, the same community where after college I lived and became a teacher and a principal. Reeb and his wife chose to live where he worked not just to help the community, but to be a part of the community. And when the NAACP sued the Boston School Committee over de facto segregation, Reeb supported the lawsuit. What drove this Unitarian Universalist minister turned community organizer to work for and with his black neighbors at the height of racial tensions in the 1960s? What motivated him to answer the call to come to Selma after seeing what the whole country saw on Bloody Sunday. I can't say for sure, but if I had to guess, it would be the moral and ethical decision to choose love. The audacious kind of love that brings a person to believe that in Dr. King's words, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The kind of love that moves a person to help bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice the kind of love that acknowledges that the fate of your children in a public school is tied to the kids sitting next to your children and the kids in the next town over and the kids on the other side of the state, no matter their skin color. I'd like to spend a few moments talking about what this ethic of radical love embodied by Jim Reeb and his life and by Dr. King urges us to do with respect to educational equity. I'm reminded of two occasions in which Dr. King told one of his favorite parables and one of my favorite parables, that of the Good Samaritan. I think these two examples help explain the kind of radical love Reeb expressed, and they call on us to put our love into action today. To help explain, let's take a short trip back in time. On the eve of his assassination, Dr. King addressed a crowd in Memphis. His goal was to rally the people to keep up their support for sanitation workers who the city was not treating fairly. Just as the road to Jericho is a dangerous road, the road to economic justice is not without risk, Dr. King emphasized. He knew some folks were tired in the fight for justice. Some were worried about what retribution they might face, what trouble might befall them if they stopped their lives to stay with this movement on behalf of others. Dr. King conveyed empathy toward the people and shared the parable of the Good Samaritan. He suggested that maybe the, the priest and the Levite didn't stop to help the wayward traveler on the road to Jericho because they too were afraid. Maybe they feared if they stopped to help the person in distress, they'd end up in a ditch right there with him. In Dr. King's telling of the parable, they ask, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan, according to Dr. King, asked a different question. The Good Samaritan asked, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the kind of radical, audacious love I'm talking about. That's the kind of love Dr. King called on folks to embody. Not what's in it for me, but what do you need? And how can I help? What do you need? How can I help? And wrapping up what would be his final moments behind a microphone, Dr. King called on those in attendance 
to keep up the struggle even though it wasn't theirs. It's not in the same way. He said, quote, nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point. We've got to see it through. You may not be on strike, but either we go up together or we go down together. I want you to meditate on that line for a moment. Either we go up together or we go down together. Dr. King couldn't have predicted how the COVID-19 pandemic more than a half century later would prove him so right. He couldn't have predicted how deeply interconnected we all are and how this devastating pandemic has illustrated that deep connection. Now I want to share with you another time that Dr. King relayed the story of the Good Samaritan. It was a dozen years before his assassination when he was a young preacher at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And the message there was a little bit different. In a sermon entitled The One-Sided Approach of the Good Samaritan, for which only notes survive, Dr. King seems to suggest the actions of the Good Samaritan are a minimum threshold of acceptable behavior in society. He wrote, quote, the person who fails to look with compassion upon the thousands of individuals left wounded by life's many roadsides is not only unethical, but ungodly. Stop and ask, what do you need and how can I help? In Dr. King's eyes, was a minimum standard. Not enough, a minimum standard. Dr. King critiqued what he considered the weakness of the Good Samaritan, who was concerned merely with temporary relief, not with, quote, thorough reconstruction. The Good Samaritan sought to soothe the effects of evil, Dr. King argued, without going back to uproot the causes. Dr. King is saying, yes, of course, stop on the side of the road and offer help. In fact, you have a moral obligation to do so. We all do. But we also have a moral obligation to do more, to join together and to make a safer road so there are fewer who suffer in the first place. And I like to suggest that this is the spirit with which Reed fought to end housing and school segregation in Boston and would have continued had his life not been cut short. His audacious, radical love enabled him to see people with different struggles through a lens of shared humanity. Now, before I talk about what this ethic of radical love embodied by Reeve and Dr. King urges us to do with respect to educational equity, I want to address something you may be thinking and feeling about the current moment we're living in Reverend Abi has rightly said, this is a time when people's comfort cannot be centered. So I want to invite you to lean into your discomfort, if what I'm about to say brings you any. For many of us, there may be a tape playing in our head right now. And for some, it's louder than for others. And it goes something like this. I'm comfortable, but I've earned it. I worked hard. I made good choices. I didn't even helped other people along the way. I faced my share of hardship and I made my way through to the other side. I deserve what, my have, what I have and my children deserve what I can provide for them. A former professor of mine, Michael Sandel, calls it the myth of meritocracy. And he argues it's actually killing the American dream. He argues that seeing one's own individual success as disconnected from the community goods all around us that help make that success possible is deeply dangerous. Let me give you an example from education. The college admissions scandal, what many of you may remember as the, the varsity blues scandal, is an extreme version of what can happen when people put this ethic of meritocracy, of deservingness into action. What happened? Well, folks who were very wealthy and well-connected and mostly white felt entitled to have their children attend a certain college or university. So they used the power they had earned, money, relationships, and a belief that they'd get away with it to bribe their kids into the college of their choice, Yale, Stanford, USC. There were rules. They cheated. They broke the rules. Everyone can see this is wrong. The courts have agreed. Some famous people have even been sentenced to prison. 
But the myth of meritocracy doesn't require cheating to undermine the American dream for the majority who have too often been failed by our systems. Legacy admissions in exchange for alumni donations, while the doors of these colleges are barred for the vast majority of students who can't afford the rising costs. It's the myth of meritocracy. Moving into the best neighborhoods with the best schools, while others couldn't even rent a room in one of those neighborhoods and are forced to attend overcrowded and under-resourced public elementary and secondary schools, it's the myth of meritocracy at work. All of this is legal. All of it is based on an idea that you deserve to benefit from what you've earned, and all of it risks deepening racial and economic divides if we ignore that what we've earned is so deeply tied to all the resources in the community around us. Indeed, the child in the under-resourced school your kids don't attend is the person on Jericho Road. The child in a classroom in Baltimore wearing a coat in their classroom during the winter because the heat doesn't work is the person on Jericho Road. The child in a high school on the Eastern Shore who'll miss out on the opportunity to attend Johns Hopkins, her dream school, because her high school doesn't offer as many advanced courses in math and science as the schools that her peers attend in other parts of the state. She's the person on Jericho Road. The students of color in Montgomery County, more likely to be assigned to a first year teacher, more likely to be in a school with a first year principal, more likely than white peers to be suspended and less likely than white peers to be in AP courses. They are the person on Jericho Road. The fact is, Many of us in this community aren't just walking by without stopping. We're taking an entirely different road. And if we don't heed Dr. King's warning, then I promise you, we won't go up together. We will go down together. So where are we when it comes to education equity? I won't, I won't dwell on the data, that, but the picture is stark. I'm sure you know the general contours. First thing to point out is that we had racial and socioeconomic inequities in our schools and colleges before COVID-19. The pandemic is both exposing and exacerbating those disparities. They won't disappear whenever this virus is under control unless we take meaningful action to eliminate them. Nationally, the schools serving the most Black, Latino, and Native American students spend about $1,800 less per student per year than the schools with the fewest students of color. We have 1.7 million children who are in schools where there's a sworn law enforcement officer and no school counselor. While other students in other schools have unlimited access to AP courses and enrichment activities to boost their resumes for college. Black, Latino, and Native American adults are less likely to hold a college degree today than white adults in 1990. Public colleges should reflect the broader population. There's not a single state in the country where selective admission public colleges enroll and graduate percentages of Black and Latino students that match the percentage of Black and Latino young adults in their state. In fact, in a majority of cases, selective admission public colleges enroll a lower percentage of Black students today than they did 20 years ago. There's a lot of work to do right here in Maryland as well to ensure equal opportunity in education. The Black and Brown Coalition here in Montgomery County is calling for Black and Brown students to have access to effective and diverse teachers and leaders and rigorous coursework to help them unlock their talents and move forward on their educational journey. It's no more than anyone would want for their children. Why does the coalition and countless black and brown families have to even ask for these things? Yet in this context, Governor Hogan has refused to fund the Kerwin Commission education proposals and he's refused to repay the state's historically black colleges and universities the public funding they're owed. And while a third of 18 to 24 year olds in this state are black, only about 12% of undergraduate students at the University of Maryland College Park are black. If we're driven by the kind of radical love that drove Reeb and King to bend the arc toward justice, then wouldn't we fight for kids in Silver Spring or in Caroline County to have the kind of educational experience kids in Potomac get? 
That means we must commit to genuine resource equity, not just equitable access to dollars, but equitable access to quality early childhood education, equitable access to well-prepared teachers, equitable access to art, music, all the things that matter. We must demand for other people's children what we would want for our own. And if we are honest, we know that the greatest barrier to that equity in resources is our history of racial and socioeconomic segregation. Only about 10% of K-12 budgets comes from the federal government. The rest comes from state and local taxes, about half each typically. And property taxes, those local taxes are driven by property values. And so when neighborhoods and schools track lines of race and class, the reality is we invest the least in the children who need the most. It's an ethic of materialism and the myth of meritocracy perpetuating this system but doesn't have to be that way. So what would it look like to put our ethics into action to truly advance educational equity? Here are three broad ideas and I look forward to getting into more details with Corey in our discussion. First, we need to join together across lines of difference to help bring about what Reverend Barber calls the third reconstruction. There was emancipation and the Civil War, a brief period of reconstruction, and then the Ku Klux Klan, and then Jim Crow. That was the first reconstruction. Then there was a civil rights movement, which Reverend Barber considers the second reconstruction, but that was followed by the war on drugs, the policies of mass incarceration, and other reactionary measures that threatened the lives and livelihoods of black, brown, and poor Americans. And so what Barber argues is that we now must be in the process of building a third reconstruction, a moral awakening that could guide the country toward greater fulfillment of our promise. Yet we know we're already seeing the extreme resistance to that third reconstruction. We see it in the birtherism. That was an attempt to undermine the legitimacy of the nation's first black president. We see it in the voter suppression laws that popped up after the Supreme Court restricted the scope of the voting rights Voting Rights Act, as I talked about earlier. We see that in the continued unaccounted for violence against black citizens by the police. What Reverend Barber argues, and I agree completely, is the only way to continue bending the arc toward justice in the face of such resistance is to build the kind of fusion coalition that brings together people of all backgrounds united in love and committed to advancing justice together, committed to building what Congressman Lewis would call the beloved community. The Poor People's Campaign, which grew out of the organizing Dr. Barber did as head of the NAACP in North Carolina, he is a wonderful example of this kind of fusion coalition. Second, we each need to ask how our individual and family decisions might make matters worse, and then we need to commit to at a minimum doing no harm, ultimately to advancing an ethic of anti-racism. The Nice White Parents podcast is, a, is an excellent cautionary tale on this front. And I encourage you to listen to it. What it shows is how well-meaning self-described liberals can actually make things worse for black and brown children if they're asking what's in it for me instead of what do you need and how can I help? As a community, we need to challenge ourselves to honor Montgomery County's tradition of racial and socioeconomic integration by ensuring not only that school assignment policies protect and affirmatively advance that integration, but that across the county and within each school, equitable opportunities are available to all of our students, regardless of race, regardless of income, regardless of the language they speak at home, regardless of immigration status. Especially in today's world, diversity and integration offer a path to better outcomes and brighter futures for every child in this county and across America. Research has shown that students in socioeconomically and racially diverse schools, regardless of their own economic status, achieve stronger academic outcomes. Studies have shown that students in integrated schools earn higher test scores, are less likely to drop out of high school, and more likely to enroll in college. Importantly, 
learning in diverse schools can help prepare all children, children of color and white children for engaged citizenship, to contribute to our society and our democracy, for the jobs they'll have someday, and to become more empathetic adults who can demonstrate the type of radical love we're talking about this evening. Finally, third, putting into action an ethic of radical love means changing policy to, as Dr. King said, uproot the causes of injustice. This means matching our rhetoric with our actions. We can't say Black Lives Matter and also say no affordable housing in my neighborhood. We can't claim the banner of progressive and at the same time resist efforts by Black and Brown and low-income families to integrate neighborhoods and schools. If we resist resource equity and racial integration efforts, whether at the federal, state, or local level, then we have to admit we don't actually love others in the way the Unitarian Universalist tradition and the civil rights tradition call on us to love others. Let me close with a, with a bit of personal reflection. A, a couple of years ago, I was asked to give the commencement address at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore from which my grandmother graduated in 1894. In preparation for the speech, I began a family history research project. And while I knew, like most African Americans, that slavery had a role in my family's journey, I didn't realize that where my family lives today in Silver Spring turns out to be just 25 miles from where my ancestors were enslaved in Laytonsville. <clears throat> I didn't realize that the property where my family members were enslaved is still owned by the direct descendants of the people who enslaved my ancestors. My great grandfather, the, the cabin, the cabin where he lived as an enslaved person is still standing on the property. I had the opportunity to visit the property, to stand in that cabin, those enslaved people's quarters, to talk with the family descended from those who owned my family. It's been a surreal experience, but it's also been an inspiring one. It has helped me to understand our journey as a country. Through some of the genealogy work, one of the things I learned was that my great-grandfather's sister, my Aunt Anne, when she was 15, actually reported her owner, informed on her owner for uh, collaborating with the Confederacy. There was a trial in, in Baltimore based on her accusation against her owner, who was indeed consorting with the Confederacy. One of the things that's so powerful about that story is the risk that she took personally as an, as an enslaved person, she saw injustice and she spoke up and she challenged that injustice. She challenged that system. She challenged that institution. If she could do that, despite the risk to her life, despite the risk to her family, if she could stand up in that way, if she could reject silence, what excuse do we have for inaction? If you have any doubt whether you are needed in the work to further educational equity and justice, my response, like the response that Jim Reed, Jim Reed heard, my response is badly. You are needed badly. Please don't walk by. Please don't take another road. Please help ensure that every child, every young person has what you would want for your own child. The eulogy in Boston for James Reed closes with a reflection on what he might say if he were still alive. I'll quote that. If Jim Reed were writing these words, his eulogist said, I think he might now say, well, what's the next step? And I think he might say, if he were here, there is a killer in the dark and racist streets of the South. But there is a killer in the North too one which strikes black and white in the bright light of day, every day. And the killer's name is non-involvement. It is apathy and lack of interest. It is self-concern. This is the killer James Reed was stalking. And when he found him, 
he was going to wrap him around with righteousness and justice and love. There is now an awakening in our nation. The eulogy continued. Let it be a real awakening and let there be an end to complacent sleep. 55 years later, at another time of great crisis, I am indeed hopeful that we are in the midst of another moral awakening, a commitment to audacious and radical love. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this conversation. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. King. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Am I, uh... All right, great. So my name is Corey Turner. I am an edu education correspondent with NPR National Public Radio. And I first met Dr. King back when he was Secretary King. Um, and for those of you out there, I see lots of questions in the Q&A, and a lot of them have to do with school funding, which turns out is the first thing I discussed with Secretary King way back when uh, I led a project at NPR called School Money, which was all about how we do and do not fund our schools. So if anybody wants to know more, maybe a lot more, um, just look up school money at npr.org. Uh, a little bit of business. Uh, you can submit your questions for Dr. King in the Q&A section. Um, please try to keep it in the Q&A and not the chat. Um, I will be going through them uh, along with a colleague as Dr. King fields as many questions as we can get to. And I, I think we'll, we'll start with a question that that overlaps with a lot of what I've seen in the Q&A so far, and it's also been a perennial for me as an education reporter. Um, how, how do we create a more equitable education system when our schools are funded in large part, as you said, from local property taxes? And that has been true for so long. Um, Every time I report on it it, it, it seems like the great intractable in this story. And, and I don't know practically what, what can be done, if anything. Yeah. Well, that is a fundamental challenge. And we have this long tradition around property taxes. But, but I would argue we have to reduce our reliance on property taxes to fund our schools. And for me, that means uh, more federal dollars. Uh, the federal government, as I said, only accounts for about 8 to 10 percent, as you know, of the funding for education. And yet, public education is the foundation of our democracy. We need a larger federal commitment. I would move the reliance on local dollars and shift that towards state dollars. It's that, that was really the vision behind the current commission recommendations here in Maryland, was to say the state has to take a larger role in funding schools and in the communities that are struggling to generate local resources and that are also often serving the kids with the highest needs and the biggest challenges in their lives outside of school. But I also, and you know, we talked about this when I was secretary, I think one of the things we have to grapple with is even within districts, we often have inequities. They can't be blamed on property taxes because the, the property taxes are shared, right, in the district, but the districts choose to send more resources to some schools than others. And there's always a rationale, there's always a story, but you can go to many districts around this country and you can find one high school with 20 AP classes and another high school with two. One high school with you know, an army of counselors to support kids around post-secondary planning and another high school where there's a law enforcement officer and no school counselor. And so we also have to hold up a mirror to ourselves and say, are we truly committed to an equitable allocation of resources even within our own district? And certainly that's a question we have to ask ourselves in Montgomery County as we think about the financial decisions that our board has to make. Yeah, well, if, for the folks out there, um, another thing I would recommend you look up. Uh, if you're curious, uh, one of the most interesting stories I've, I've ever covered, I think, was the fight you picked, Secretary King, over this very nerdy thing called supplement not supplant. And it's important to understand because 
those of you who don't know, school budgets uh, are allocated in large part around positions, not dollars. And so when the secretary talks about um, inequitable funding, even within a single district, the huge driver of that inequity is in the pay for the teachers. So you may have two schools, one a relatively low income school and the other not in the same district. They may both have 25 staff positions, but if the school with fewer low income kids generally has more experienced teachers who earn more money, that's going to be a huge driver of inequity. And I'm wondering, Secretary, talk about another institutional barrier to equity. I mean, you, you ultimately had to give up that fight when you were secretary. And I'm curious, do you see any movement on that in the future? Or is that just one of those things that, that lawmakers, policymakers, and advocates are just going to have to accept and move on? You know, it's really challenging because I think everyone would agree you don't want to be in a situation where folks are forced to move between schools, where transfers are forced between schools. So it's very hard to, to get to a strategy to rectify the gap that you're describing. What we argued then and what I still believe is that uh, districts over time need to make decisions about teacher placement. They need to create incentives to keep uh, strong teachers in schools that are serving the highest needs kids. And that over time, not overnight, but over time, we could remedy that inequity. You know, I would, I would say more broadly, Nicole Hannah-Jones, you know, the Pulitzer Prize uh, winner, Arthur Genius Fellowship winner, who's written a lot about school segregation. What, what Nicole would argue is that to the extent that we isolate low-income students of color in a subset of school, the way systemic racism operates, sort it's insidious. It will always result in those schools getting less resources. And so she makes the argument, we, we've got to take on very directly uh, racial and socioeconomic integration if we really want to achieve resource equity. Mm -hmm. Well, so there's a question in the Q&A that I think gets to the heart of the matter there. It's from Reverend, Reverend Charlene Belson. She says, we still live in highly segregated enclaves, you know, going back to the days of redlining. Um, our schools are segregated because our communities are segregated. So we have a chicken or the egg problem. How do we create learning in diverse schools she asks, um, when our schools and neighborhoods remain homogeneous. Yeah, no, that's right. Two observations. One is, you know, there was a study that was done a couple of years ago that looked at the, essentially the gerrymandering of school assignment zones, where it is true, we do live in very racially and socioeconomically divided neighborhoods, but where schools are located and which blocks they serve can push you towards greater or less segregation. Again, this is something that Montgomery County has to grapple with. And I would argue we should, when we're making those school assignment decisions, we should put our weight on the side of schools that are more racially and socioeconomically diverse because it's better for academic outcomes and it's better for uh, the preparation of citizens in our democracy. Now, secondly, housing policy is education policy. And so if we have housing policies that restrict the construction of affordable housing, if we have restrictions on density that are set up to maintain um, those patterns of racial and socioeconomic segregation, that takes us in the wrong direction. And so we've really got to ask ourselves if we're serious about racial and socioeconomic integration, are we willing to rethink some of our housing policies to, to allow the construction, as we have in some parts of the county, right, to allow the construction of affordable housing, to allow multifamily units to create neighborhoods that are more racially and socioeconomically diverse. You've got a couple of uh, school choice and charter school questions in the Q&A, which, uh, which I'm excited to ask you about. For those of you who don't know, um, Dr. King, helped start Roxbury Prep, um, and also was a foundational leader for Uncommon Schools. You have been an advocate of, of charters. And I'm curious, especially in the current context uh, with the Trump administration and Secretary DeVos 
pushing not, not only a kind of choice that includes charters, but also private schools and using more federal dollars to fund private schools. Where does choice fit into your vision of a more equitable system? Yeah. Well, I believe very deeply in the role of public education in our democracy. So I, I, I don't want to take away somebody's right to choose a private school for their kid, but I don't think that the public should subsidize that. So I think we should have public dollars for public schools with public accountability. Now, within that framework of public education, I do think there's a role that charters can play when well regulated, right? And one of the challenges is that charter means vastly different things across the country. So in Massachusetts, where I was a principal, uh, they're very selective about who gets a charter. There's very close oversight of the academics and the operations of the schools. Um, the schools in Boston largely serve low-income students of color. Um, they're willing to close schools if they do a bad job. Uh, so there's very clear oversight and accountability. And the result is that if you look at the charter sector in Boston, they're creating a real path to opportunity for a lot of kids. Very high rates of uh, not only academic performance, but success in, in college. I would contrast that with Michigan. And uh, you'll, you'll know that I've, I've been talking about how bad Michigan's charter law is even before I knew who Betsy DeVos was. Turns out that Betsy was very involved in the Michigan charter law. Michigan has a terrible charter law. They have a terrible charter sector. They have a proliferation of for-profit schools, which I would ban, but you know, they, they have these for-profit schools that are more about their shareholders and about kids. They have schools that are terribly low performing, schools that are, you know, I would argue, uh, doing more harm than anything else to the system. So, you know, the, the problem is when, when we talk about the charter sector, what's happening in Massachusetts and what's happening in Michigan get lumped together and they're very, very, in my, my view, very, very different. Um, my hope would be that over time, what we'll be able to do is get rid of terrible charter laws like Michigan and be able to have a charter sector that is true to its original mission, creating opportunity for kids and, and creating some laboratories for innovative practices that then might be shared across schools. Got a question here from a member of the Montgomery County Council, Hans Riemer. Um, what do you think are the most promising major federal initiatives that perhaps the next administration and Congress might enact to support local education? Yeah, well, um, one I'd love I appreciate the question from Hans, who's my county council member, uh, my neighbor. Uh, so we ought, we ought to um, radically increase Title I. There have been a number of proposals of late to significantly increase funding for Title I. That's the main funding source for federal dollars going to low-income students, as you know. Um, there's a need to make a much bigger investment in federal civil rights enforcement. That's something that the the current administration, the Trump administration, has largely uh, dismantled and undermined. We need to reinvigorate civil rights enforcement uh, so we can address things like the disparities we see in discipline. We just did a report at the Education Trust on uh, the disparities in the suspension and arrest of uh, Black girls in our schools. And so we need a civil, robust civil rights enforcement effort. To, to address that. Um, and then we've, we've got, I think, some real opportunities to cultivate some innovations that would be very helpful. Three quick ones. Uh, we know kids have lost a lot of ground because of the closure of schools in the spring and, and schools in many places that are not able to do in-person instruction. We know high dosage tutoring has a very positive impact, a mountain of research evidence we ought to have a national tutoring court, something the United Kingdom is doing, the Netherlands is doing. Uh, we ought to take a program like AmeriCorps, double it or more, as Senator Coons has proposed, and we ought to have a national tutoring court and match young people who've just graduated from college with uh, K-12 students to help them make up ground academically. Second, uh, we have a mountain of evidence that early childhood matters immensely, that 
there's like a nine to one return on investment in, in high quality early childhood education. Uh, I would love to see a federal effort to say we're going to have universal high quality early childhood education zero to four. Um, and it's doable in the wealthiest country in the world. We just need, we need to do it. Third, there's just a, a proposal that uh, Senator Booker and Congressman Castro put forward to have a federal program to close the gap in access to advanced coursework, to make sure that uh, kids have access to AP classes, that there's professional development for teachers so that they can teach AP classes. Uh, this is a challenge in high needs urban schools, it's a challenge in high needs rural schools. Kids just don't have access to those opportunities and it closes uh, post-secondary opportunities to them. Uh, so those, those are a few examples. But, you know, my hope is, well, we'll, we'll see what happens uh, in November, but my hope is that we will be having a conversation about a much more ambitious uh, national effort to invest in education. I do want to ask a, a, a sort of emergency question related to COVID, um, because obviously equity is important and it's important to talk about it and to, to think strategically long term. But as you said, I mean, I, I was doing some reporting even just in June that found that vulnerable kids, low income kids, students of color were losing at least six months of learning and maybe up to 10 or 11 months of learning. Um, it, it feels to me uh, as a reporter, like many if not most of our schools just don't have the infrastructure to, to make up that gap. Uh, and I'm curious if you've given much thought to it or, or have any sense of what can be done. Yeah. Well, first I have to say it didn't have to be this way, right? That the current administration mishandled the pandemic. So we had the level of community spread that we've had. So we had to have not just closure in the spring, but, we're, but many places around the country where we still can't go back to school. It also didn't have to be this way that distance learning was um, so challenging. Um, we know, for example, from the Pew study, 79% of white families have reliable internet access, 66% of black families have reliable internet access, 61% of Latino families. We knew that in the spring. Now we're going into this new school year and we still don't have a federal commitment to ensure that all kids have internet access. Right, so, so I just, I want to frame this by saying it didn't have to be this way. We didn't have to see this level of academic harm, but here we are. So what we need is a federal investment in expanded learning time. You know, when we get back to bricks and mortar, we're going to need after school programming. We're going to need potentially summer. It doesn't have to look exactly like the school year. It can be a mix of enrichment activities, art, music, sports, and academics, but we're going to need more time to make up for the learning loss. We're gonna need this national tutoring core, this intensive work. Uh, we're gonna to need to make up for the lost time for students with disabilities. I really worry a lot about kids with disabilities whose their parents, you know, kids with significant disabilities, their parents have struggled so much to, to support them. And I, I'm often hearing from parents about the way they've seen their kids um, I was talking with a parent, uh, with, with someone today, I was talking about a parent who's a good friend who has a child with autism and how much the child has regressed without all the supports that, that were in place at school. So um, we've got to, I think, commit as a country that we're gonna, we're gonna make up this ground. We're, we can't afford to have a lost generation of students. It's interesting, you mentioned students with disabilities. I. I just did a story on the challenges facing their families. And, you know, every parent reminded me of something that every education reporter knows, which is the federal government has never uh, subsidized IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, above, what is it, 40%? You probably know better than I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how can we take our commitment to education and educational equity seriously if the law meant to protect kids with disabilities from um, receiving substandard service 
isn't even half funded by Congress. Yeah. I mean, the, to me, this, the, the, this goes to the heart of you know, the, the, the theme of the lecture. And, and to me, this question of you know, what does it mean to be an ethical person? And what does it mean to have an ethical society? And as the wealthiest country in the world, couldn't we say that those who have so much could give a little bit more so that we could have a more just society, right? And I, I feel that way about health care. I feel that way about education for students with disabilities. Could we just ask a little bit more of those who have so much so that we can make sure that all of our kids get the education they deserve? That is achievable, right? And I worry that we're in this moment this is going to be a nerdy history teacher way to frame it, but we're in this moment where we've got basically a, a Hoover versus FDR argument taking place. And we see this at the federal level, and, and frankly, we see it at the state level. Some people are saying, well, we have an economic crisis. We just have to do less. We just have to expect less, hope for less. And then we have other people who are saying, no, no, this is an FDR moment where we say, this crisis has shown us all of these challenges that existed before COVID. Let us together build a stronger society going forward. Let's strengthen our safety net. Let's invest in education. And that, that's the choice we're confronted with. And, and if we see this as an FDR moment, then we ought to address these longstanding uh, failures to adequately fund education for students with disabilities. We ought to address these long-standing inequities? You know, there are a couple questions here in the Q&A that, um, that talk about PTAs and the, the huge differences in funding for PTAs from school to school and district to district. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you see any opportunity in those differences to channel resources from one parent group to a, an adjacent parent group. Um, sometimes I think that, that at least some of these inequities are really just about, we still don't quite know how to get money from point A to P, point B when it comes to our public schools because they're paid for by taxes. Um, I'm wondering if there's opportunity in this PTA idea. Yeah, well, a couple of things. One is I, I, you know, I think on the micro level, I think yeah, we're in a wealthy school or wealthy community. Can we mobilize some of our energy to direct some of those resources that we're raising towards higher needs schools? But I'd also pose the question, this goes again back to this question of what is, the, what is ethical conduct? Maybe we should spend a little time at the school board meeting saying, rather than raising money for the arts teacher for our school, shouldn't we be saying every school in the district should have an arts teacher? And shouldn't we be you know, pestering the school board member, the county council member, the state legislator about making sure every kid has access to art and music and a counselor and, right? I mean, I guess this to me is the central dilemma. We, we, of course, we all love our kids and we want the best for our own kids. But I believe that our ethical responsibility is to want a good education for all kids. Got a question in here about state level, and I suppose this brings us back to the Kerwin Commission, you know, talking about Maryland, but what are the handful of things, or maybe even just the most important thing that can be done at the state level, policy-wise, to make Maryland schools more equitable? Yeah. Well, look, you know, the, the legislature went through this process, um, passing the recommendations of the Kerwin Commission. The Kerwin Commission looked at the highest performing systems, not just in the United States, but across the world, and ask what are they doing well, right? And what they're doing well is they're investing in early childhood, they're making sure their teachers are well prepared and well compensated, well supported, they're creating opportunities for teacher leadership in their schools, they're um, creating pathways not only to um, college success, but also career success. Right, and they, they created a report, they gave it to the legislature, the legislature debated it, they, they uh, 
made the commitment that the state would fund Kerwin over, over the next few years um, to try to close gaps within the state and ensure a high quality education for every kid. This is very much in the tradition of Massachusetts that did something very similar in 93, where they made a big commitment of additional resources and the right policies and Massachusetts went from middle of the pack to highest performance. So we were sort of on the, on the precipice of, I think of a very important change. And then the governor vetoed Irwin and made the argument, well, we just can't afford it. And I would argue and said, we can't afford not to do it. We can't afford not to invest, make these investments. Why should we, we, why should we pay, you know, hundred thousand dollars to incarcerate someone rather than spend those dollars to give them a quality education so that they can have a productive life. So that, that's one state level policy that's needed. Another I mentioned about historically black colleges and universities. It is still true today that HBCUs are among the strongest drivers of the production of black teachers, black lawyers, black doctors. If we want a thriving black middle class in the United States of America, we have to invest in our historically black colleges and universities. The HBCUs in Maryland showed that the state over years had deprived them of resources, had intentionally created programs at predominantly white institutions that duplicated programs at HBCUs. They won in court. The legislature rightly said, we're gonna put significant resources to make HBCUs whole for the harm that the state has done. And again, the governor vetoed it on, on a sort of Hoover-like argument, we, we, we can't afford it. Well, this is short-sighted thinking. We ought to be thinking about how do we mobilize our resources in the state to make sure that students have K-12 and higher ed opportunity because that's the right thing for the long-term health of our economy. It's the right thing for the long-term health of our democracy. A couple questions in here. Um, wanting more information about this idea of a tutoring core. Mm. Uh, I'm really curious too. Um, can you just get a little more specific about how you think that could work and what what the benefits might be ultimately? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we have these randomized controlled trials uh, to be a little wonky about it, right? Where, where like in medicine, Kids are uh, assigned to a treatment or in a control group. And we have randomized controlled trials from multiple places across the world showing that high dosage tutoring, right, intense work with a well-trained tutor, helps kids make significant academic progress quickly. And so the idea is, well, we have these young people who are graduating from college into a very uncertain economy. Couldn't we mobilize their efforts to train them as tutors? And there are things that we know. For example, we have, a, we have a whole body of science around how kids learn to read. Couldn't we equip those tutors with that knowledge on how to support kids' reading development and then match them uh, with kids so that they can get the support they need to make reading progress? Or think about the pods that you know, the wealthy people around the country are gonna spend money on. Now they're gonna have pods to support their kids while they work through their um, distance learning, right? Why shouldn't we have essentially a pod theory, but for economically vulnerable kids where we match them with, again, one of these tutors who then works with them and says, oh, how is this project? Let me help you. I see you're struggling with this math problem. Let me help you with that. We could do it through Zoom, you know, safely now and, and hopefully eventually in person. Um, Tennessee, in Tennessee this summer, Governor Haslam, the former governor of Tennessee, Republican, uh, he, from his personal money, from his personal foundation, funded a Tennessee tutoring corps matching college students with uh, younger students to help them around reading. We trained them up, we deployed them to support kids. Uh, and as I mentioned, the UK and the Netherlands are both preparing to make a major investment in this tutoring corps. Um, and we have examples around the country. There's a tutoring program called Saga, uh, which is a nonprofit that operates in, in Chicago and New York. That's showing really strong results for math tutoring in high school. 
Um, City Year has demonstrated over the years the ability through a mix of tutoring and mentoring, the ability to positively impact student outcomes. So this is achievable. Um, and it also has an additional economic benefit that we're creating these job opportunities that are gonna help young people grow. And maybe some of them will decide to become teachers. I wanna ask a personal question. Uh, as a parent, you're a parent, uh, you might be having these conversations in your household too. Um, with school remote for my family, um, my wife and I have talked about, we have the privilege of working from home our kids will be in separate spaces. We will make it work. Um, but we have been thinking a lot about the other families in our district, in our neighborhoods, in our school community who don't have that privilege. And we've been at a loss as to what to do about it. Overwhelmed as so many people are by the moment itself. And I'm just wondering practically, what would you say to parents like us, like folks all over the country who may not be paying, you know, some freelance teacher to teach a pot of kids, but who are drawing on their wells of privilege to just get by. Yeah, yeah. How well, can I, we help? I think about this all the time. You know, my, my girls are uh, 14 and 16 going into ninth and 12th grade. So mostly I just have to periodically do a little nagging, you know, How's your work coming? So I, you know, it's not what my friends who have little ones are, are, are doing, but, but we have tremendous privilege. Both my wife and I are able to work from home or we are able to not be in the position that essential workers are exposing themselves to COVID. Um, you know, I think all the time about the racial gap that we have here, you know, only one in five uh, African-Americans in the workforce can work from home. Only one in six Latinos in the workforce can work from home. So two things, one is, you know, I understand everyone's gonna do what they need to for their own kid, trying to make sure their own kid is safe and, and learning productive. But I think the ethical responsibility is to, is to set aside some of your time and energy to try to advocate for other kids. And, you know, it, as I mentioned, Senator Coons has this proposal to double AmeriCorps that would make some this tutoring core possible. Let's go fight for that. Let's go find to make sure that, that we can make that happen. Let's go to the school board and talk about, well, what additional supports are gonna be made available for kids who are most vulnerable, kids who are homeless, kids who are in foster care, kids who are English learners, kids who are students with disabilities. How, what additional supports, you know, maybe they should be the ones, maybe it's the most vulnerable students who should be the ones who go back first when it's safe to go back to school. Um, maybe we should start right away when, when it's safe to go back to school with extended time for those students. So I think there is a, a, a kind of moral responsibility to ask that question, you know, that Dr. King was urging the Good Samaritan to ask, what do you need? How can I help? And then more deeply, what is, what is the structural change that could be made uh, to make this situation better? I think this is probably gonna be our last question. I see a lot of eagerness for more practical advice. Um, a line from your talk struck me, something I've heard Reverend Abi mentioned before, talking about audacious love, but how we make it manifest. Give me one concrete thing that folks in the audience can do to make manifest that kind of audacious love tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And not just write a letter to Hans, since yeah, he listens yeah, to this yeah. already. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, I, I, will, I will give you two. Um, one is to be of service, right? To be, that could be volunteering uh, with young people that could be volunteering at one of the places that's providing meals. We have 14 million kids who are food insecure right now. Uh, it could be um, volunteering to help one of these high school students who doesn't have access to a counselor to figure out how they're gonna go to college and how to do their college applications, right? Actually committing your time to be of service to others. 
But the second, it's not quite writing a letter to Hans, but it is to be in the policy fight. Because sometimes I worry that if people stop at the sort of personal service, they aren't taking that next step of challenging the structures and the systems. And we have to in this moment. Right, if you if you see the the, you know, the shooting that happened in Wisconsin just this week, and that has to make everyone say like, what what more can I do to put myself in a position to make our society more just? It's, it's something that Vice President Biden said about John Lewis. He said, when you're around John Lewis, it makes you ask yourself, what else should I be doing? What more could I be doing? And that to me is the is the, the spirit of tonight's conversation, and it's it's you know I, I as I was preparing for today, I was thinking about Jim Reeb and thinking, gosh, like what more what more can I do? How how can I uh, do more to to live my values around social justice? Uh, Secretary John King, I really appreciate you joining us tonight. And uh, thank you for your remarks. Thank you to everybody else. I'm going to pass it off now for a goodbye to Reverend Avi Janamachi. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, Corey. And uh, thank you, Dr. King, for both uh, facilitating a wonderful discussion and for your many good responses. Before we close tonight, I would like to thank everyone who helped with today's lecture, the Kiplinger lecture team that not only organized the lecture, but also participated with uh, facilitation and, and other ways of supporting this event. Our Cedar Lane staff, Claire Jaycox and Nicole Kazi, who has been providing the closed captioning today. Our technical director, Barb Thompson and uh, education trust staff, Philip Martin and Tia Border. And we are deeply grateful to Dr. King for honoring us tonight. And in the face of an exceedingly challenging time and of trying incidents, for sharing a message of prophetic challenge, resilient hope, and an audacious and radical love that will not let us go, let us down, or let us off the hook. So I close with the words of another Dr. King, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from his 1967 speech, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence, in which he calls for a radical revolution of values. He said, if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. A true revolution of values will soon cause to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. These are revolutionary times all over the globe, people are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression, and out of the wounds of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. Now, let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. The choice is ours, and though we might prefer it otherwise, we must choose in this crucial moment of human history. If we will make the right choice, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood and sisterhood. And if we will but make the right choice, we will be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And to that, I say, amen.
Thank you again for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you at a future Kiplinger lecture in a few months. Have a good night.